Section one of stories by foreign authors, Russian authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sudo Shatawans and Sudo Gun from Bangkok, Thailand. Stories by foreign authors, Russian authors, by various. Mumu by Ivan Trusinov. Translated by Constant Garnet. Part one. In one of the outlying streets of Moscow, in a grey house with white columns and a balcony warp or skew, there was once living a lady, a widow, surrounded by a numerous household of serfs. Her sons were in the government service at Petersburg. Her daughters were married. She went out very little, and in solitude lived through the last years of her misery and dreary old age her day a joyless and gloomy day had long been over but the evening of her life was blacker than night of all her servants the most remarkable personage was the porter gerasim a man full twelve inches over the normal height of heroic build and deaf and dumb from his birth the lady his owner had brought him up from the village where he lived alone in a little hut apart from his brothers and was reckoned about the most punctual of her peasants in the payment of the seigneurial dues and though with extraordinary strength he did the work of four men work flew apace under his hands and it was a pleasant sight to see him when he was plodding while with his huge palms pressing hard upon the plough he seemed alone unaided by his poor horse to cleave the yielding bosom of the earth or when about st peter's day he piled his sigh with a furious energy that might have mounted a young birch corpse up by the roots or swiftly and untiringly wielded a flail over two yards long why the heart of long muscles of his shoulder rose and fell like a lever his perpetual silence lent a solemn dignity to his unvaryingly labour he was a splendid peasant, and except for his affliction, any girl would have been glad to marry him. But now they had taken Gerasim to Moscow, bought him boots, had him made a full skirted coat for summer, a sheepskin for winter, put into his hand a broom and a spade, and appointed him porter. At first, he intensely disliked his new mode of life. From his childhood he had been used to feel labour, to village life, shut off by his affliction from the society of men. He had grown up dumb and mighty, as a tree grows on a fruitful soil. When he was transported to the town, he could not understand what was being done with him. He was miserable and stupefied, with the stupefaction of some strong young bull taken straight from the meadow where the rich grass stood up to his belly taken and put in the truck of a railway train and there where smoke and sparks and gods of steam puff up upon the sturdy beast he is whirled onwards whirled along with loud roll and whistle what gerasim had to do in his new duty seemed a mere trifle to him after his hot toy as a peasant in half an hour all his work was done and he would once more stand stock still in the middle of the courtyard, staring open mouth at all the passer-by, as though trying to wrest from them the explanation of his perplexing position. Or he would suddenly go off into some corner and flinging a long way off the broom or the spade, throwing himself on his face on the ground, alive for hours together without stirring, like a caged beast. But man gets used to anything, and Gerasim got used to at last to living in town he had little work to do his whole duty consisted in keeping the courtyard clean bringing in a barrel of water twice a day splitting and dragging in wood for the kitchen and the house keeping out strangers and washing at night and it must be said he did his duty so lastly in his courtyard there was never a shaving lying about never a speck of dust of sometimes in the muddy season he rushed nag put under his chart for fetching water got stuck in the road he would simply give it a shove 
with his shoulder and set not only the cart but the horse itself moving if he set the chopping wood the axe fairly arranged like glass and chips and chunks flew in all directions and as for stranger after he had one night called two thieves and knocked their heads together knocked them so that there was no the slightest need to take them to the police station afterwards every one in the neighbourhood began to feel a great respect for him even those who came in the daytime by no means robbers but simply unknown persons at the sight of the terrible porter waved and shouted to him as though he could hear the shouts with all the rest of the servants gerasim was on term hardly friendly they were afraid of him but familiar he regarded them as his fellows they explained themselves to him by signs and he understood them and exactly carried out all order but knew his own rights too and soon no one dared to take his seat at the table gerasim was altogether of a strict and serious temper he liked order in everything even the cocks did not dare to fight in his presence or woe betide them directly he caught sight of them he would seize them by the legs swing them ten times round in the air like a wheel and throw them in the different direction there were geese too kept in the yard but the goose as is well known is a dignified and reasonable bird gerasim felt a respect for them looked after them and fed them he was himself not unlike a gander of the steepest he was assigned a little garret over the kitchen he arranged it himself to his own liking made a bedstead in it of oak boards on the four stumps of wood for legs a truly titanic bedstead one might have put a ton or two on it it would not have been under the load under the bed was a solid chest in a corner stood a little table of the same strong kind and near the table a three-legged stool so solid and squat that gerasim himself would sometimes pick it up and drop it again with a smile of delight the garret was locked up by means of a padlock that looked like a college or basket-shaped loaf only black the key of these padlock gerasim always carried about him in his girdle he did not like people to come into his garret so passed a year at the end of which a little incident befell gerasim the old lady in whose service he lived as porter adhered in everything to the ancient ways and kept a large number of servants in her house were not only laundresses seamstresses carpenters tailors and tailoresses there was even a harness maker he was reckoned as a veterinary surgeon too and a doctor for the servants there was a household doctor for the mistress there was lastly a shoemaker by name captain klimov a sad drunkard klimov regarded himself as an injured creature whose merits were unappreciated a cultivated man from petersburg who ought not to be living in moscow without occupation in the wild so to speak and if he drank as he himself expressed it empathically with a blow on his chest it was sorrow drove him to it so one day his mistress had a conversation about him with her head steward gavrila a man whom judging solely from his little yellow eyes and nose like a duck's beak fate itself it seemed had marked out as a person in authority the lady expressed her regret at the corruption of the morals of a captain who had only the evening before been picked up somewhere in the street now gavrila she observed all of a sudden now if we were to marry him what do you think perhaps he would be steadier why not marry him indeed ma'am he could be married ma'am answered gavrila and it would be a very good thing to be sure ma'am yes only who is to marry him ay ma'am but that's at your pleasure ma'am he may anyway so to say be wanted for something he can't be turned adrift altogether i fancy he likes tatiana gavrila was on the point of making some reply but he shut his lips tightly yes let him marry tatiana the lady decided taking a pinch of snuff complacently do you hear yes ma'am gavrila articulated and he withdrew returning to his own room it was in a little lodge 
and was almost filled up with metal-bound trunks. Gavrila first sent his wife away, and then sat down at the window and pondered. His mistress's unexpected arrangement had clearly put him in a difficulty. At last he got up and sent to call Capitan. Capitan made his appearance, but before reporting that conversation to the reader, we consider it not out of place to relate in few words who was this Tatiana whom it was to be Capitan's lot to marry and why the great lady's order had disturbed it, the steward katiana one of the laundresses referred to above as a trained and skilful laundress she was in charge of the fine linen only was a woman of twenty-eight thin fair hair with moles on her left cheek moles on the left cheek are regarded as of evil omen in russia a token of unhappy life katiana could not boast of her good luck from her earliest youth she had been badly treated she had done the work of two and had never known affection she had been poorly clothed and had received the smallest wages relations she had practically none an uncle she had once had a butler left behind in the countryside as useless and other uncles of her were peasants that was all at one time she had passed for a beauty but her good looks were very soon over. In this position, she was very meek, or rather scared. Towards herself, she felt perfect indifference. Of others, she stood in mortal dread. She thought of nothing but how to get her work done in good time, never talked to anyone, and trembled at the very name of her mistress, though the latter Saxley knew her by sight. When Gerasim was brought from the country, she was ready to die with fear on seeing his huge figure, try all she could to avoid meeting him, even drop her eyelid when sometime he changed to run past him. Hurrying from the house to the laundry, Gerasim at first paid no special attention to her, then he used to smile when she came his way, then he began even to stare admiringly at her. And at last he never took his eyes off her, she took his fancy whether by the mild expression of her face or the timidity of her movements who can tell so one day she was stealing across the yard with a stark dressing jacket of her mistress carefully poised on her outspread fingers someone suddenly grabs her vigorously by the elbow she turned round and fairly screamed behind her stood gerasim with a foolish smile making inarticulate caressing grunt he held out to her a gingerbread cock with gold tinsel on his tail and wings she was about to refuse it but he thrust it forcibly into her hand shook his head walked away and turning around once more grunted something very affectionately to her from that day forward he gave her no peace wherever she went he was on the spot at once coming to meet her smiling grunting waving his hands all at once he would pull a ribbon out of the bosom of his smock and put it in her hand or would sweep the dust out of her way the poor girl simply did not know how to behave or what to do soon the whole household knew of the dumb poor the wise jeers jokes lie hands were showered upon tatiana at gerasim however it was not everyone who would dare to scoff he did not like jokes indeed in his presence she too was left in peace whether she liked it or not the girl found herself to be under his protection like all deaf mutes he was fairly suspicious and very readily perceived when they were laughing at him or at her one day at dinner the wardrobe keeper tatiana's superior fell to nagging as it had called at her and brought the poor thing to such a state that she did not know where to look and was almost crying with vexation gerasim got up all of a sudden stretched out his gigantic hand laid it on the wardrobe maid's head and looked into her face with such grim ferocity that her head positively flopped upon the table everyone was still gerasim took up his spoon again and went on with his cabbage soup look at him the dumb devil the wood demon they all muttering in undertones Why the wardrobe maid got up and went out into the maid's room Another time, noticing that Cabinon, the same Cabinon who was the subject of the conversation reported above, was gossiping somewhat too attentively with Tatiana, Gerasim beckoned him to him, 
led him into the car shed and taking up a shaft that was standing in a corner by one end lightly but most significantly menaced him with it since then no one addressed a word to tatiana and all these caused him nothing it is true that wardrobe maid as soon as she reached the next room promptly fell into a fainting fit and behaved altogether so skilfully that Jerusalem Ralph actually reached his mistress's knowledge the same day that the capricious old lady only laughed and several times to the great offence to the wardrobe maid forced her to repeat how he bent your head down with his heavy hand and next day she sent Jerusalem a rubble she looked on him with favour as a strong and faithful watchman Jerusalem stood in considerable awe of her but all the same he had hopes of her favour and was preparing to go to her with a petition for leave to marry tatiana he was only waiting for a new coat promised him by the steward to present a proper appearance before his mistress when the same mistress suddenly took it into her head to marry tatiana to captain the reader will now readily understand the perturbation of mind that overtook the steward gavrila after his conversation with his mistress my lady he thought as he sat at the window favours gerasim to be sure gavrila was well aware of this and that was why he himself looked on him with an indulgent eye still he is a speechless creature i could not indeed put it before the mistress that gerasim's courting to tina but after all it's true enough he is a queer sort of husband but on the other hand that devil god forgive me has only got to find out they are marrying to tin and to captain he will smash up everything in the house for my soul there's no reasoning with him why he is such a devil god forgive my sins there is no getting over him no how upon my soul captain's entrance broke the thread of gavrila reflections the dissipated shoemaker came in his hand behind him a lodging carelessly against the projection angle of the wall near the door crossed his right foot in front of his left and tossed his head as much as to say what do you want gavrila looked at gibbidon and drummed with his fingers on the window frame gibbidon merely screwed up his leaden eyes a little but he did not look down he even grinned slightly and passed his hand over his whitish locks which were sticking up in all direction well here i am what is it you are a pretty fellow said gavrila and paused a pretty fellow you are there is no denying Capitan only twitched his little shoulder are you any better pray he thought to himself just look at yourself now look at yourself gavrila went on reproachfully now whatever do you look like Capitan serenely surveyed his shabby tatter coat and his patches trousers and with special attention stared at his burst boots especially the one on the tiptoe of which his right foot so gracefully poised and he fixed his eyes again on the steward well well repeated gavrila well and then you say well you look like old nick himself god forgive my saying so that's what you look like captain blinked repeatedly go on abuse me go on if you like gavrila andrish he thought to himself again here you have been drunk again gavrila began drunk again haven't you eh? come answer me owing to the weakness of my health i have exposed myself to spiritious beverages certainly replied captain owing to the weakness of your health they let you off too easy that's what it is and you have been apprentice in petersburg must you learn in your apprenticeship you simply eat your bread in idleness in that matter gavrila andrish there is one to judge me the lord god himself and no one else he also knows what manner of man i be in this world and whether i eat my bread in idleness and as concerning your contention regarding drunkenness in that matter too i am not to blame but rather a friend he led me into temptation but was diplomatic and got away while i why you were left like a goose in the street ah uh, you are dissolute fellow but that's not the point the steward went on 
I have something to tell you. Our lady. Here he paused a minute. Is our lady's pleasure that you should be married, do you hear? She imagines you may be steadier when you are married. Do you understand? To be sure I do. Well then, for my part, I think it would be better to give you a good hiding. But that it's her business. Well, are you agreeable? Kevin grinned. Matrimony is an excellent thing for anyone, Gorilla Andrish, and as far as I am concerned, I shall be quite agreeable. Very well, then, replied Gorilla, while he reflected to himself. There is no denying the man expresses himself very properly, only there is one thing. The wife our ladies pick out for you is an unlucky choice. Why, who is she? Permit me to inquire. Tatiana. Tatiana? And Capitan opened his eyes and moved a little away from the wall. Well, what are you in such a taking for? Isn't she to your test, hey? Not to my taste, do you say, Gorilla Andrish? She is right enough, a hard-working city girl. But you know very well yourself, Gorilla Andrish, why that fellow, that wild man of the woods, that monster of the steepest, he is after her, you know? I know, mate. I know all about it, the butler cut him short in a tone of annoyance. But there, you see. But upon my soul, Gorilla Andrish, why, he will kill me, by God, he will, he will crush me like some fly. Why, he's got a fist. Why, you kindly look yourself what a fist he got. Why, he's simply got a fist like Minin Posaski. You see, he is deaf. He beats and does not hear how he is beating. He swing his breakfast as if he is asleep, and there's no possibility to pacifying him. And for why? Why? Because as you know yourself, Gorilla Andrish, he is deaf, and what's more, has no more wit than the heel of my foot. Why, he is a sort of beast, a hilt and idle Gorilla Andrish, and worse, a block of wood. What have I done that I should have to suffer from him now? Sure it is. It's all over me now. I have knocked about. I have had enough to put up with. I have been battered like an earthenware pot. But still, I'm a man after all, and not a worthless pot. I know, I know. Don't go talking away. Lord, my God! The shoemaker continued warmly. When is the end? When, O oh Lord? A poor wretch I am, a poor wretch whose suffering are endless. What a life, what a life minds being come to think of it. In my young days, I was beaten by a German I was apprenticed to. In the prime of life, beaten by my own countrymen. And last of all, in ripe years, see what I have been brought to. Oh, you flabby so, said Gorilla Andrish. Why do you make so many words about it? Why, do you say? Gorilla Andrish, it's not a beating I'm afraid of, Gorilla Andrish. A gentleman may chastise me in private, but give me a civil word before folks, and I am a man still, but see now who I have to do with. Come, get along, Gorilla interposed impatiently. Capitan turned away and staggered off. But if it were not for him, the steward shouted after him, you would consent for your part. I signify my acquiescence retorted Cabinet as he disappeared. His fine language did not desert him, even in the most trying positions. The steward walked several times up and down the room. Well, poor Tatiana now, he said at last. A few instants later, Tatiana had come up almost noiselessly and was standing in the doorway. What are your orders, Gorilla Andrish? she said in a soft voice. The steward looked at her intently. Well, Tanisha, he said, would you like to be married? Our lady has chosen a husband for you. Yes, Gorilla Andrish, and whom has she dined to name as a husband for me? She added fatalingly. Capitan, the shoesmaker. Yes, sir. He is a fader brain fellow, that's certain, but it's just for that the mistress reckons upon you. Yes, sir. There's one difficulty. You know the deaf man him. He is courting you, you see. How did you come to bewitch such a bear? But you see, he will kill you. Very like he is such a bear. He will kill me, Gabriela Andrews. He will kill me, and no mistake. Kill you? 
well we shall see about that what do you mean by saying he will kill you has he any right to kill you tell me yourself i don't know gavilla anguish about his having any right or not what a woman why you have made him no promise i suppose what are you pleased to ask for me the steward was silent for a little thinking you are a meek so well that's right he said aloud we will have another talk with you later now you can go to nisha i see you are not unruly certainly Tatiana turned steady herself a little against the door post and went away and perhaps our lady will forget all about his waiting by to-morrow thought the steward and here am i worrying myself for nothing as for that insolent fellow we must tie him down if it comes to that we must let the police know astinja Feodorovna, he shouted in a loud voice to his wife heed the smova my good soul all that day tatiana hardly went out of the laundry at first she had started crying then she wiped away her tears and said to her as before Captain stayed till late at night at the gin shop with a friend of his a man of gloomy appearance to whom he related in detail how he used to live in petersburg with a gentleman who would have been all right except he was a bit too strict and he had a slight weakness besides he was too fond of drink and as to the fair sex he didn't stick at anything his gloomy companion merely said yes but when Caridon announced at last that in a certain event he would have to lay hands on himself to-morrow his gloomy companion remarked that it was bedtime and they parted in surly silence meanwhile the steward's anticipation were not fulfilled the old lady was so much taken up with the idea of captain's wedding that even in the night she talked of nothing else to one of her companions who was kept in her house solely to entertain her in case of sleeplessness and like a night cabman slept in the day when gorilla came to her after morning tea with his report her first question was and how about our wedding is it getting on all right he replied of course that it was getting on first rate and that captain would appear before her to pay his reverence to her that day the old lady was not quite well she did not give much time to business the steward went back to his own room and called a council the matter certainly called for serious consideration tatiana would make no difficulty of course but captain had declared in the hearing of all that he had but one head to lose not two or three gerasim turned rapid sullen looks on every one would not budge from the step of the maid quarters and seemed to guess that some mischief was being hatched against him they met together among them was an old sideboard waiter nicknamed uncle tail to whom every one looked respectfully for counsel though all they got out of him was he a pretty pass to be sure to be sure to be sure as a preliminary measure of security to provide against contingencies they locked captain up in the lumber room where the filler was kept then considered the question with the gravest deliberation it would to be sure be easy to have recourse to force but heaven save us that would be an uproar the mistress would be put out it would be awful what should they do they thought and thought and alas thought out a solution it had many a time been observed that gerasim could not bear drunkards as he sat at the gate he would always turn away with disgust when some one passed by intoxicated with unsteady steps and his cap on one side of his ear they resolved that tatiana should be instructed to pretend to be tipsy and should pass by gerasim staggering and reeling about the poor girl refused for a long while to agree to this but they persuaded her at last she saw too that it was the only possible way of getting rid of her adorer she went out Cameron was released from the lumber room, for, after all, he had an interest in the affair. Gerasim was sitting on the copstone at the gate, scraping the ground with a spade from behind every corner, from behind every window blind. The others were washing him. The trick succeeded beyond all expectation. On seeing Tatiana at first, he nodded as usual, making caressing, inarticulate sounds. Then he looked carefully at her dropped at his spade jumped it up went up to her brought his face close to her face in her fright she staggered more than ever and shut her eyes 
he took her by the arm brought her right across the yard and going into the room where the council had been sitting pushed her straight at capitan tatiana fairly swooned away gerasim stood looked at her waved his hand laughed and went off stepping heavily to his garret for the next twenty-four hours he did not come out of it the postilion and tipka said afterwards that he saw gerasim through a crack in the wall sitting on his bedstead his face in his hand from time to time he uttered soft regular sounds he was wailing a dirge that is swaying backwards and forwards with his eyes shut and shaking his head as driver or bargemen do when they chant their melancholy songs and tipka could not bear it and he came away from the crack when gerasim came out of the garret next day no particular change could be observed in him he only seemed as it were more morose and took not the slightest notice of the tiana or captain the same evening they both had to appear before their mistress with geese under their arms and in a week's time they were married even on the day of the wedding gerasim showed no change of any sort in his behaviour only he came back from the river without water he had somehow broken the barrel on the road and at night in the stable he washed and rubbed it down his horse so vigorously it swayed like a blade of grass in the wind and staggered from one leg to the other under his bits of iron all this had taken place in the spring another year passed by during which Cavadon became a hopeless drunkard and as being absolutely of no use for anything was sent away with the store wagons to a distant village with his wife on the day of his departure he put a very good face on it at first and declared that he would always be at home send him where they would even to the other end of the world but later on he lost heart began grumbling that he was being taken to uneducated people and collapsed so completely at last that he could not even put his own hat on some charitable soul stuck it on his forehead set the pig straight in front and thrust it on with a slap from above when everything was quite ready and the peasants already held the reins in their hands and were only waiting for the words with god's blessing to start gerasim came out of his garret went up to tatiana and gave her as a parting present a red cotton handkerchief he had bought for her a year ago tatiana who had up to that instant borne all the revolting details of her life with great indifference could not control herself upon that she burst into tears and as she took her seat in the cart she kissed gerasim three times like a good chieftain he meant to accompany her as far as the town barrier and did walk beside her cart for a while but he stopped suddenly at the crimean ford waved his hand and walked away along the riverside it was getting towards evening he walked slowly watching the water all of a sudden he fancied something was floundering in the mud close to the bank he stooped it over and saw a little white and black puppy who in spite of all its efforts could not get out of the water it was struggling slipping back and trembling all over its thin but little body gerasim looked at the unlucky little dog picked it up with one hand put it into the bosom of his coat and hurried with long step homewards he went into his garret put the rescue puppy on his bed covered with his thick overcoat ran first to the stable for a stroll and then to the kitchen for a cup of milk carefully folding back the overcoat and spreading out the straw he set the milk on the bed steed the poor little puppy was not more than three weeks old its eye was just open one eye still seemed rather larger than the other it did not know how to lap out of a cup and did not think but shiver and blink Jerusalem took hold of his head softly with two fingers and dipped it its little nose into the milk the puppy suddenly began lapping greedily sniffing shaking itself and choking gerasim washed and washed it and all at once he laughed outright all night long he was waiting on it keeping it covered and rubbing it dry he fell asleep himself at last and slept quietly and happily by its side no mother could have looked after her baby as gerasim looked after his little nursling at first she for the pup turned out to be a bitch was very weak feeble and ugly but by degrees but by degree she grew stronger and improved in looks 
and thanks to the unflagging care of her preserver, in eight months' time she was transformed into a very pretty dog of the spaniel breed, with long ears and bushy spiral tail and large, expressive eyes. She was devotedly attached to Gerasim and was never yard from his side. She always followed him about wagging her tail. He had even given her a name. The dumb know that their inarticulate noises call the attention of others. She called her Mumu. All the servants in the house liked her and called her Mumu too. She was very intelligent. She was friendly with everyone but was only fond of Gerasim. Gerasim on his side loved her passionately and he did not like it when other people stroked her, whether he was afraid for her or jealous, God knows. She used to wake him in the morning, pulling at his coat. She used to take the rein in her mouth and bring him up the old horse that carried the water, with whom she was on very friendly terms, with a face of great importance. She used to go with him to the river. She used to wash his brooms and spades and never allow anyone to go into his garret. He cut a little hole in his door on purpose for her, and she seemed to feel that only in Gerasim Garrett she was completely mistress and at home. And directly she went in, she used to jump with a satisfied air upon the bed at night. She did not sleep at all, but she never barked without sufficient cause, like some stupid house dog who, sitting on his hind leg, blinking with his nose in the air, barks simply from dullness at the stars, usually three times in succession. No, Mumu's delicate little voice was never raised without good reason. Either some stranger was passing close to the fence, or there was some suspicious sound or rustle somewhere. In fact, she was an excellent watchdog. It is true that there was another dog in the yard, a tawny old dog with brown spots called Wolf, but he was never even at night, let off the shame. And, indeed, he was so descriptive that he did not even wish for freedom. He used to lie curled up in his canal and only rarely utter a sleepy, almost noiseless bark, which broke off at once, as though he were himself aware of his uselessness. Mumu never went into the mistress's house, and when Jerusalem carried boot into the rooms, she always stayed behind, impatiently waiting for him at the steps, twicking up her ears and turning her head to right and to left at the slightest creak of the door. End of section one. Recording by Sorosha Thomas in Suragun from Bangkok, Thailand. Section two of stories by foreign authors, Russian authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sorosha Tawansin Surukun from Bangkok, Thailand. Stories by foreign authors, Russian authors by various. Mumu by Ivan Turgenev, translated by Constant Garnet, Part 2. So past another year, Gerasim went on performing his duties as house porter and was very well content with his lot, when suddenly an unexpected incident occurred. One by summer day, the old lady was walking up and down the drawing room with her dependents. She was in high spirits. She laughed and made jokes. Herself, her companions laughed and joked too, but they did not feel particularly mirthful. The household did not much like it when their mistress was in a lively mood, for, to begin with, she expected from everyone prompt and complete participation in her merriment, and was furious if anyone showed a face that did not beam with delight. And secondly, this outburst never lasted long with her, and were usually followed by a sour and gloomy mood. That day she had got up in a lucky hour. At cards, she took the four knaves, which means the fulfillment of one's wishes. She used to try her fortune on the cards every morning, and her tea struck her as particularly delicious, for which her maid was rewarded by words of praise and by two pence in money, with a sweet smile on her wrinkled lips. The lady walked about the drawing room and went up to the window. A flower garden had been laid out before the window and in the very middle bed. Under a rose bush lay Mumu, busily gnawing a bone. The lady caught sight of her. Mercy on us! she cried suddenly. What dog is that? The companion, addressed by the old lady, hesitated, 
poor thing in that very state of uneasiness which is common in any person in a dependent position who doesn't know very well what significance to give to the exclamation of a superior i d d don't know she flattered i fancy it's the dumb man's dog mercy the lady cut her short but it's a charming little dog order it to be brought in has he had it long how is it i have never seen it before order it to be brought in the companion flew at once into the hall boy boy she shouted bring mumu in at once she is in the flower garden her name is mumu then observed the lady a very nice name oh very indeed shim in the companion make hair stepan stepan a sturdy built young fellow whose duties were those of a footman rushed headlong into the flower garden and tried to capture mumu but she cleverly slipped it from his fingers and with her tail in the air fled full speed to gerasim who was at that instant in the kitchen knocking out and cleaning a barrel turning it upside down in his hands like a child's drum Sipan ran after her and tried to catch her just at her master's feet but the sensible dog would not let a stranger touch her and with a bound she got away gerasim looked on with a smile at all this ado alas Stephen got up much amazed and hurriedly explained to him by signs that the mistress wanted the dog brought in to her gerasim was a little astonished he called mumu however picked her up and handed her over to Stephen. Stephen carried her into the drawing-room and put her down on the parquet floor the old lady began calling the dog to her in a coaxing voice mumu who had never in her life been in such magnificent apartments was very much frightened and made a rush for the door but being driven back by the obsequious stepan she began trembling and had it close up against the wall mumu mumu come to me come to your mistress said the lady come silly thing don't be afraid come mumu come to the mistress repeated the companions come along but mumu looked around her uneasily and did not stir bring her something to eat said the old lady how stupid she is she won't come to her mistress what's she afraid of she's not used to your honour yet when to one of the companions in a timid and conciliatory voice stepan brought in a saucer of milk and set it down before mumu but mumu would not even sniff at the milk and still shivered and looked round as before ah what a silly you are said the lady and going up to her she swooped down and was about to stroke her but mumu turned her head abruptly and showed her teeth the lady hurriedly drew back her hand a momentary silence followed mumu gave a faint whine as though she would complain and apologize the old lady moved back scowling the dog's sudden movement had frightened her ah shrieked all the companions at once she's not bitten you has she heaven forbid mumu had never bitten anyone in her life ah uh, ah uh, take her away said the old lady in a changed voice wretched little dog what a spiteful creature and turning round deliberately she went towards her boudoir her companions looked timidly at one another and were about to follow her but she stopped stared coldly at them and said who's that for pray i have not called you and went out the companion waved their hands to stepan in despair he picked up mumu and flung her promptly outside the door just at gerasim's feet and half an hour later a profound stillness led in the house and the old lady sat on her sofa looking blacker than a thunder cloud what triples if you think of it will sometimes disturb any one to evening the lady was out of humour she did not talk to any one did not play cards and passed a bad night she fancied the idol cologne they gave her was not the same as she usually had and that her pillow smelled of soap and she made the wardrobe maid smell all the bed linen in fact she was very upset and cross altogether next morning she ordered gorilla to be summoned an hour earlier than usual tell me please she began directly the latter not without some inward trepidation 
crossed the threshold of her boudoir. What the was that barking all night in our yard? It wouldn't let me sleep. A dog, ma'am. What dog, ma'am? Maybe the dumb man dog, ma'am. He brought out in a rather unsteady voice. I don't know whether it was the dumb man's or whose, but it wouldn't let me sleep, and I wonder what we have such a lot of dogs for. I wish to know we have a yard dog, haven't we? Oh, yes, ma'am. We have, ma'am. Wolf, ma'am. Well, why more? What do we want more dogs for? It's simply introducing disorder. There's no one in control in the house. That's what it is. And what does the dog man want with a dog? Who gave him leave to keep dogs in my yard? Yesterday I went to the window and there it was lying in the flower garden. It had dragged in nastiness. It was gnawing, and my roses are planted there. The lady ceased. Let her be gone from today. Do you hear? Yes, ma'am. Today. Now go. I will send for you later for the report. Gorilla went away. As he went through the drawing room, the steward, by way of maintaining order, moved a bell from one table to another. He stealthily blew his dog like nose in the hall and went into the outer hall. In the outer hall, on the locker, was Stepan asleep in the attitude of a slain warrior in a battalion picture. His bare legs thrust out below the coat which served him for a blanket. The steward gave him a shove and whispered some instructions to him, to which Stepan responded with something between a yawn and a laugh. The steward went away, and Stepan got up, put on his coat and his boots, went out and stood on the steps. Five minutes had not passed before Jerson made his appearance with a huge bundle of huge logs on his back, accompanied by the inseparable Mumu. The lady had given orders that her bedroom and boudoir should be heated at times even in the summer. Jerson turned it sideways before the door, shoved it open with his shoulder, and staggered into the house with his load. Mumu, as usual, stayed behind to wait for him. Then Stepan, seizing his chance, suddenly pounced on her like a kite on a chicken, held her down to the ground, gathered her up in his arms, and without even putting on his cap, ran out of the yard with her, got into the first fly he met, and galloped off to a market place. There he soon found a purchaser, to whom he sold her for a shilling, on condition that he would keep her for at least a week tied up. Then he returned at once, but before he got home, he got off the fly and going right round the yard, jumped over the fence into the yard from a back street. He was afraid to go in at the gate for fear of meeting Jerson. His anxiety was unnecessary. However, Jerson was no longer in the yard. On coming out of the house, he had at once Miss Mumu. He never remembered her failing to wait for his return and began running up and down, looking for her and calling her in his own way. He rushed up to his garret, up to the hayloft, ran out into the street this way and that. She was lost. He turned to the other serfs with the most despairing signs, questioned them about her, pointing to her height from the ground, describing her with his hands. Some of them really did not know what had become of Mumu, and merely shook their heads. Others did know and smiled to him for all response. Why the steward assumed an important air? and began scolding the coachman. Then Jerusalem ran right away out of the yard. It was dark by the time he came back. From his worn-out look, his unsteady walk, and his dusty clothes, it might be surmised that he had been running over half Moscow. He stood still opposite the windows of the mistress's house, took a searching look at the steps where a ground of house serves were crowded together, turned away, and uttered once more his inarticulate murmur. Mumu did not answer. He went away. Everyone looked after him, but no one smiled or said a word, and the inquisitive postilion and Tipka reported next morning in the kitchen that the dumb man had been groaning all night. All the next day, Jerusalem did not show himself, so that they were obliged to send the coachman Potap for water instead of him, and wished the coachman Potap was anything but pleased. The lady asked Gavilla, if her orders had been carried out, Gavilla replied that they had. The next morning, Jerusalem came out of his garret and went about his work. He came into his dinner, ate it, and went out again, without a greeting to anyone. 
his face which had always been lifeless as with a deaf mute seemed now to be turned to stone after dinner he went out of the yard again but not for long he came back and went straight up to the hayloft night came on a clear moonlight night Jerusalem lay breathing heavily and incessantly turning from side to side suddenly he felt something pull at the skirt of his coat he started but did not raise his head and even shut his eyes tighter but again there was a pull strong than before he jumped up before him with an end of string round her neck was murmur twisting and turning a prolonged cry of delight broke from his speechless breast. he caught up murmur and hugged her tight in his arms she licked his nose and eyes and beard and moustache all in one instant he stood a little thought a minute crept cautiously down from the hayloft looked round and having satisfied himself that no one could see him made his way successfully to his garret Josephine had gazed before that his dog had not got lost by her own doing but she must have been taken away by the mistress orders the servant had explained to him by signs that his mumu had snapped at her and he determined to take his own measures first he fed mumu with a bit of bread founded her and put her to bed then he fell to meditating and spent the whole night long in the meditating how he could best conceal her at last he decided to leave her all day in the garret and only to come in now and then to see her and to take her out at night the hole in the door he stopped it up effectually with his old overcoat and almost before it was light he was already in the yard as though nothing has happened even innocent guide the same expression of melancholy on his face it did not even occur to the poor deaf man that mumu would betray herself by her whining in reality everyone in the house was soon aware that the dark man's dog had come back and was locked up in his garret but from sympathy with him and with her and partly perhaps from dread of him they did not let him know that they had found out his secret and stuart scratched his head and gave a despairing wave of his head as much as to say well well god have mercy on him if only it doesn't come to the mistress's ears but the dumb man had never shown such energy as on the day he cleaned and scraped the whole courtyard pulled up every single weed with his own hand tuck up every stake in the fence of the flower garden to satisfy himself that day was strong enough and unaided drove them in again in fact he tore and labored so that even the old lady noticed his seal twice in the course of the day Jerson went stealthily in to see his prisoner when night came on he lay down to sleep with her in the garret not in the hayloft and only at two o'clock in the night he went out to take her a turn in the fresh air after walk about the courtyard a good while with her he was just turning back when suddenly a rustle was heard behind the fence on the side of the back street momo picked up her ears girl went up to the fence sniffed and gave vent to a loud shrill bark some drunkard had thought fit to take refuge under the fence for the night at that very time that old lady had just fallen asleep after the prolonged fit of nerving agitation this fit of agitation always overtook her after too hearty a supper the sudden bark waked her up her heart palpitated and she felt faint girls girls she moaned girls the terrified maid ran into her bed oh oh i am dying she said flinging her arms about in her agitation again that dog again oh send for the doctor they mean to be the dead of me the dog the dog again oh and she let her head fall back which always signified a swoon the rush for the doctor that is for the household physician Harriton, this doctor whose whole qualification consisted in wearing soft sole boots knew how to feel the pulse delicately he used to sleep fourteen hours out of the twenty-four but the rest of the time he was always signing and continually dosing the old lady with cherry bay drops this doctor ran up at once fumigated the room with burnt feathers and when the old lady opened her eyes promptly offered her a wine glass of the hollow drops on a silver tray the old lady took them 
but began again at once in a tearful voice complaining of the dog of gorilla and of her fate declaring that she was a poor old woman and that every one had forsaken her no one pitied her every one wished her dead meanwhile the luckless momo had gone on barking while jason tried in vain to call her away from the fence there there again groaned the old lady and once more she turned up the whites of her eyes the doctor whispered to a maid she rushed into the outer hall and shook stepan he ran to wake gorilla gorilla in a fury ordered the whole household to get up jason turned round saw lights and shadows moving in the windows and with an instinct of coming trouble in his heart put momo under his arm ran into this garret and locked himself in a few minutes later five men were banging at his door but feeling the resistance of the boat they stopped gorilla ran up in a fearful state of mind and ordered them all to wait there and watch till morning then he flew of himself to the maid's quarter and through an old companion luba blue bimorphina with whose assistance he used to steal tea sugar and other grocery and to falsify the accounts sent word to the mistress that the dog had unhappily run back from somewhere but that tomorrow she should be killed and would the mistress be so gracious as not to be angry and to overlook it the old lady would probably not have been so soon appeased but the doctor had in his haste given her fully forty drops instead of twelve the strong dose of narcotic acted in a quarter of an hour the old lady was in a sound and peaceful sleep while gerasim was lying with a white face on his bed holding mumu mouth tightly shut next morning the lady woke up rather late gravilla was waiting till she should be awake to give the order for a final assault on gerasim's stronghold while he prepared himself to face a fearful storm but the storm did not come off the old lady lay in bed and sent for the eldest of her dependent companions lubo levimovna she began a subdued weak voice she was fond of playing the part of an oppressed and forsaken victim needless to say every one in the house was made extremely uncomfortable at such times lubo levimovna you see my position go my love to gorilla andrish and talk to him a little can he really prize some fresh cur above the repose the very life of his mistress i could not bear to think so she added with an expression of deep feeling go my beloved be so good as to go to gavrila andrish for me luba blibimov now went to gavrila room what conversation passed between them is not known but a short time after a whole crowd of people was moving across the yard in the direction of jerusalem garret gavrila walked in front holding his cap on with his hand though there was no wind the footman and cooks were so close behind him uncle tail was looking out of a window giving instructions that is to say simply waving his hands at the rear there was a crowd of small boys skipping and hopping along half of them were outsiders who had run up on the narrow staircase leading to the garret sat one guard at the door were standing two more with sticks they began to mount the stairs which they entirely bobbed up gavrila went up to the door knocked with his fist shouting open the door a stifled bark was audible but there was no answer open the door i tell you he repeated but gavrila andrish stepan observed from below he's deaf you know he doesn't hear they all laughed what are we to do gavrila rejoined from above why there's a hole there in the door answered stepan so you shake the stick in there gavrila bent down he stuffed it up with a cord or something well you just push the cord in at this moment a smothered bark was heard again see see she speak for herself was remarked in the crowd and again they laughed gavrila scratched his ear no mate he responded at last you can poke the coat in yourself if you like all right let me and stepan scrambled up took the stick pushed in the coat and began waving the stick about in the opening saying come out come out as he did so 
he was still waving the stick when suddenly the door of the guard was flung open and the crowd flew pell-mell down the stair instantly gavrila first of all uncle tell locked the window come 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 shouted gavrila from the yard mind what you are about Jerusalem stood without staring in his doorway the crowd gathered at the foot of the stairs Jerusalem, with his arm akimbo looked down at all these poor creatures in german coats in his red peasant's shirt he looked like a giant before them gavrila took a step forward my mate said he don't be insolent and he began to explain to him by signs that the mistress insists on having his dog and he must hand it over at once or it would be the worse for him Jerusalem looked at him pointed to the dog made a motion with his hand round his neck and though he were pulling a noose tight and glanced with a face of inquiry at the steward yes yes the latter assented nodded yes just so Jerusalem dropped at his eyes then all of a sudden roused himself and pointed to mumu who was all the while standing beside him innocent wagging her tail and pricking up her ear inquisitively then he repeated the strangling action round his neck and significantly struck himself on the breast as though announcing he would take upon himself the task of healing mumu but you will deceive us gorilla waved back in response jerusalem looked at him smiled scornfully struck himself again on the breast and slammed it to the door they all looked at one another in silence what does that mean gorilla began he's locked himself in let him be gorilla andrish stephen advised he would do it if he had promised he liked that you know if he makes a promise it's a certain thing he's not like us other in that the truth is the truth with him yes indeed yes they all repeated nodding their head yes that's so yes uncle tell opened at his window and he to say yes well maybe we shall see responded gorilla anyway we won't take off the guard hear you iranshka he added addressing a poor fellow in a yellow nankin coat who considered himself to be a gardener what have you to do take a stick and sit here and if anything happens run to me at once eroshka took a stick and sat down on the bottom stair the crown dispersed all except a few inquisitive small boys while gavrila went home and sent word through lyubov lumimovna to the mistress that everything had been done why he sent a postilion for a policeman in case of need the old lady tied a knot in her handkerchief sprinkled some eau de cologne on it sniffed at it and rubbed her temples with it drank some tea and being still under the influence of the sherry bay drops fell asleep again an hour after all these hubbub the garret door opened and jerusalem showed himself he had on his best coat he was leading mumu by a string eroshka moved aside and let him pass jerusalem went to the gates all the small boys in the yard stared at him in silence he did not even turn round he only put his cap on in the street gavrila sent the same eroshka to follow him and keep watch on him as a spy eroshka seeing from a distance that he had gone into a cook shop with his dog waited for him to come out again Jerusalem was well known at the cook shop and his signs were understood he asked for cabbage soup with meat in it and sat down with his arms on the table Mumu stood beside his chair, looking calmly at him with her intelligent eyes. Her coat was glossy. One could see she had just been combed down. They brought Jerusalem the soup. He crumbled some bread into it, cut the meat up small, and put the plate on the ground. Mumu began eating in her usual refined way, her little muscle gently held so as softly to touch her food. Jerusalem gazed a long while at her two big tears suddenly rolled from his eyes one fell on the dog's brown the other into the soup he shaded his face with his hand mumu ate up half the plateful and came away from it licking her lips Jerusalem got up paid for the soup and went out followed by the rather perplexed glances of the waiter eroshka seeing Jerusalem hit round a corner and letting him get in front followed him again Jerusalem walked without haste, 
still holding Mumu by a string. When he got to the corner of the street, he stood still as though reflecting, and suddenly stood all with rapid step to the crying ford. On the way he went into the yard of a house, where a loge was being built, and carried away two bricks under his arm. At the Crimean ford, he turned along the bank, went to a place where there were two little rowing boats fastened to stakes. He had noticed them there before, and jumped into one of them with Momo. A lame old man came out of a shed in a corner of a kitchen garden and shouted after him, but Gerasim only nodded and began growling so vigorously, though against the stream, that in an instant he had darted two hundred yards away. The old man stood for a while, scratched his back first with the left and then with the right hand, and went back hobbling to the shed. Gerasim rode on and on. Moscow was soon left behind. Meadows stretched east side of the bank, market gardens, fields and corpses, peace and huts began to make their appearance. That was the fragrance of the country. He threw down his oars, then it has down to Mumu, who was sitting facing him on a dry cross seat. The bottom of the boat was full of water, and stay motionless. His mighty hands collapsed upon her back, while the boat was gradually carried back by the current towards the town. Alas, Gerasim drew himself up hurriedly, with a sort of sick anger in his face. He tied up the bricks he had taken with string, made a running noose, put it round Mumu's neck, lifted her up over the river, and for the last time looked at her. She watched him confidingly without any fear, faintly wagging her tail. He turned it away, frowned, and wrung his hands. Gerasim heard nothing, neither the quick shrill whine of Mumu as she fell, nor the heavy splash of the water. For him, the noisiest day was soundless and silent as even the stillness night is not silent to us. When he opened his eyes again, little wavelet were hurrying over the river, chasing one another as before they broke against the boat side, and only far away behind white circles were widening to the bank. Directly, Gerasim had vanished from Irashka's sight. The latter returned home and reported what he had seen. Well then, observed Stepan, he will drown her. Now we can feel easy about it, if he once promises a thing. No one saw Gerasim during the day. He did not have dinner at home. Evening came on. They were all gathered together to supper except him. What a strange creature that Gerasim is, piped a fat laundronette. Fancy upsetting himself like that over a dog, upon my word. But Gerasim has been here, Stephen cried all at once, scraping up his porridge with a spoon. How? When? Why? A couple of hours ago. Yes, indeed. I ran against him at the gate. He was going out again from here. He was coming out of the yard. I tried to ask him about his dog, but he wasn't in the best of humors. I could see. Well, he gave me a shove. I suppose he only meant to put me out of his way as if he would say, Let me go. Do. But he fetched me such a crack on the neck, so seriously, that, oh, oh, oh. And Stephen, who could not help laughing, struck up and rubbed the back of his head. Yes, he added, he has got a fist. It's something like a fist. There's no denying that. They all laughed at Stephen, and after supper, they separated to go to bed. Meanwhile, at the very time, a gigantic figure with a bag on his shoulders and a stick in his hand was eagerly and persistently stepping out along the tea high road. It was Gerson. He was hurrying on without looking round, hurrying homewards to his own village, to his own country. After drowning poor Mumu, he had run back to his garret, hurriedly packed a few things together in an old horse cloth tie it up in a bundle, toss it on his shoulder, and so was ready. He had noticed the road carefully when he was brought to Moscow. The village his mistress had taken him from lay only about twenty miles off the high road. He walked along in with a sort of invincible purpose, a desperate and, at the same time, joyous determination. He walked, his shoulders drawn back and his chest expanded, his eyes were fixed greedily straight before him. He hastened it as though his old mother were waiting for him at home, as though she were calling him to her after long wandering in strange parts, among strangers. The summer night, that was just drawing in, was still and warm. On one side, 
where the sun had set the horizon was still light and faintly flushed with the last glow of the vanished day on the other side of wood glade twilight has already risen up the night was coming up from that quarter quails were in hundreds around corncracks were calling to one another in the tickets gerasim could not hear them he could not hear the delicate night whispering of the trees by which his strong legs carried him but he smelled the familiar scent of the reckoning rye which was wafted from the dark fields he felt the wind flying to meet him the wind from home beat caressingly upon his face and played with his hair and his beard he saw before him the whitening road homewards straight as an arrow he saw in the sky star innumerable lightning up his way and step out strong and bold as a lion so that when the rising sun shed its moist rosy light upon the still fresh and unwearied traveller already thirty miles lay between him and moscow in a couple of days he was at home in his little hut to the great astonishment of the soldier's wife who had been put it there after praying before the holy pictures he set off at once to the village elder the village elder was at first surprised but the hay cutting had just begun Joseph was a first-rate mover, and they put a scythe into his hand on the spot, all in his old way, mowing so that the peasants were fairly astounded as they watched his wide sweeping stroke and the heaps he raked together. In Moscow, the day after Joseph flight and missed him, they went to his garret, rummaged about in it, and spoke to Kavila. He came, looked, shrugged his shoulders, and decided that the dumb man had either run away or had drowned himself with his stupid dog. They gave information to the police and informed the lady. The old lady was furious, burst into tears, gave orders that he was to be found whatever happened, declared she had never ordered the dog to be destroyed, and, in fact, gave Gavrila such a rating that he could do nothing all day but shake his head and murmur, Well, until Uncle Tell shake him at last, sympathetically echoing, We're ill. Alas, the news came from the country of Gerasim's being there. The old lady was somewhat pacified. At first, she issued a mandate for him to be brought back without delay to Moscow. Afterwards, however, she declared that such an ungrateful creature was absolutely of no use to her. Soon after this, she died herself, and her heirs had no thought to spare for Gerasim. They let their mothers and other servants redeem their freedom on payment of an annual rent. And Jerusalem is living still, a lonely man in his lonely hut. He is strong and healthy as before, and does the work of four men as before. And as before is serious and steady, but his neighbors have observed that ever since his return from Moscow, he has quite given up the society of women. He will not even look at them, and does not keep even a single dog. It is good luck, though, the peasant reason, that he can get on without female folk, and as for a dog, what need has he of a dog? You wouldn't get a thief to go into his yard for any money. Such is the fame of the dog man's titanic strength. End of section two. Recording by Sura Chatawan and Sura from Bangkok, Thailand. Section three of Stories by Foreign Authors, Russian Authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Thaler. Stories by Foreign Authors, Russian Authors, by Various. The Shot, by Alexander Pushkin. Translated by T. Keen. Chapter 1. We were stationed in the little town of N., the life of an officer in the army is well known. In the morning, drill and the riding school, dinner with the colonel or at a Jewish restaurant. In the evening, punch and cards. In N, there was not one open house, not a single marriageable girl. We used to meet in each other's rooms where, except our uniforms, we never saw anything. One civilian only was admitted into our society. He was about 35 years of age, and therefore we looked upon him as an old fellow. His experience gave him great advantage over us, 
in his habitual taciturnity, stern disposition, and caustic tongue, produced a deep impression upon our young minds. Some mystery surrounded his existence. He had the appearance of a Russian, although his name was a foreign one. He had formerly served in the Hussars, and with distinction. Nobody knew the cause that had induced him to retire from the service and settle in a wretched little village, where he lived poorly and, at the same time, extravagantly. He always went on foot, and constantly wore a shabby black overcoat. But the officers of our regiment were ever welcome at his table. His dinners, it is true, never consisted of more than two or three dishes prepared by a retired soldier, but the champagne flowed like water. Nobody knew what his circumstances were, or what his income was, and nobody dared to question him about them. He had a collection of books, consisting chiefly of works on military matters and a few novels. He willingly lent them to us to read, and never asked for them back. On the other hand, he never returned to the owner the books that were lent to him. His principal amusement was shooting a pistol. The walls of his room were riddled with bullets, and were as full of holes as a honeycomb. A rich collection of pistols was the only luxury in the humble cottage where he lived. The skill which he had acquired with his favourite weapon was simply incredible, and if he had offered to shoot a pair off somebody's forage cap, not a man in our regiment would have hesitated to place the object upon his head. Our conversation often turned upon duels. Silvio, so I will call him, never joined in it. When asked if he had ever fought, he dryly replied that he had, but he entered into no particulars, and it was evident that such questions were not to his liking. We came to the conclusion that he had upon his conscience the memory of some unhappy victim of his terrible skill. Moreover, it never entered into the head of any of us to suspect him of anything like cowardice. There are persons whose mere look is sufficient to repel such a suspicion, but an unexpected incident occurred which astounded us all. One day, about ten of our officers dined with Silvio. They drank as usual, that is to say, a great deal. After dinner we asked our host to hold the bank for a game at Faro. For a long time he refused, for he hardly ever played, but at last he ordered cards to be brought, placed half a hundred ducats upon the table, and sat down to deal. We took our places round him, and the play began. It was Silvio's custom to preserve a complete silence when playing. He never disputed and never entered into explanations. If the punter made a mistake in calculating, he immediately paid him the difference, or noted down the surplus. We were acquainted with this habit of his, and we always allowed him to have his own way. But among us on this occasion was an officer who had only recently been transferred to our regiment. During the course of the game, this officer absently scored one point too many. Silvio took the chalk and noted down the correct account according to his usual custom. The officer, thinking that he had made a mistake, began to enter into explanations. Silvio continued dealing in silence. The officer, losing patience, took the brush and rubbed out what he considered was wrong. Silvio took the chalk and corrected the score again. The officer, heated with wine, play, and the laughter of his comrades, considered himself grossly insulted, and in his rage he seized a brass candlestick from the table and hurled it at Silvio, who barely succeeded in avoiding the missile. We were filled with consternation. Sylvia rose, white with rage, and with gleaming eyes said, My dear sir, have the goodness to withdraw, and thank God that this has happened in my house. None of us entertained the slightest doubt as to what the result would be, and we already looked upon our new comrade as a dead man. The officer withdrew, saying that he was ready to answer for his offence in whatever way the banker liked. The play went on for a few minutes longer, but feeling that our host was no longer interested in the game, we withdrew one after the other, and repaired to our respective quarters, after having exchanged a few words upon the probability of there soon being a vacancy in the regiment. The next day, at the riding school, we were already asking each other if the poor lieutenant was still alive, when he himself appeared among us. We put the same question to him, 
and he replied that he had not yet heard from Sylvia. This astonished us. We went to Sylvia's house and found him in the courtyard, shooting bullet after bullet into an ace pasted upon the gate. He received us as usual, but did not utter a word about the event of the previous evening. Three days passed, and the lieutenant was still alive. We asked each other in astonishment, Can it be possible that Silvio is not going to fight? Silvio did not fight. He was satisfied with a very lame explanation, and became reconciled to his assailant. This lowered him very much in the opinion of all our young fellows. Want of courage is the last thing to be pardoned by young men, who usually look upon bravery as the chief of all human virtues, and the excuse for every possible fault. But by degrees everything became forgotten, and Silvio regained his former influence. I alone could not approach him on an, the old footing. Being endowed by nature with a romantic imagination, I had become attached more than all the others to the man whose life was an enigma, and who seemed to me the hero of some mysterious drama. He was fond of me, at least with me alone did he drop his customary sarcastic tone, and converse on different subjects in a simple and unusually agreeable manner. But after this unlucky evening, the thought that his honour had been tarnished, and that the stain had been allowed to remain upon it in accordance with his own wish, was ever present in my mind, and prevented me treating him as before. I was ashamed to look at him. Silvio was too intelligent and experienced not to observe this, and guess the cause of it. This seemed to vex him. At least I observed once or twice a desire on his part to enter into an explanation with me, but I avoided such opportunities, and Silvio gave up the attempt. From that time forward, I saw him only in the presence of my comrades, and our confidential conversations came to an end. The inhabitants of the capital, with minds occupied by so many matters of business and pleasure, have no idea of the many sensations so familiar to the inhabitants of villages and small towns, as, for instance, the awaiting the arrival of the post. On Tuesdays and Fridays our regimental bureau used to be filled with officers, some expecting money, some letters, and others newspapers. The packets were usually opened on the spot, items of news were communicated from one to another, and the bureau used to present a very animated picture. Silvio used to have his letters addressed to our regiment, and he was generally there to receive them. One day he received a letter, the seal of which he broke with a look of great impatience. As he read the contents, his eyes sparkled. The officers, each occupied with his own letters, did not observe anything. Gentlemen, said Silvio, circumstances demand my immediate departure. I leave to-night. I hope that you will not refuse to dine with me for the last time. I shall expect you, too, he added, turning towards me. I shall expect you without fail. With these words he hastily departed, and we, after agreeing to meet at Silvio's, dispersed to our various quarters. I arrived at Silvio's house at the appointed time, and found nearly the whole regiment there. All his things were already packed. Nothing remained but the bare, bullet-riddled walls. We sat down to table. Our host was in an excellent humour, and his gaiety was quickly communicated to the rest. Corks popped every moment, glasses foamed incessantly, and with the utmost warmth we wished our departing friend a pleasant journey and every happiness. When we rose from the table, it was already late in the evening. After having wished everybody good-bye, Silvio took me by the hand, and detained me just at the moment when I was preparing to depart. "'I want to speak to you,' he said, in a low voice. I stopped behind. The guests had departed, and we two were left alone. Sitting down opposite each other, we silently lit our pipes. Silvio seemed greatly troubled. Not a trace remained of his former convulsive gaiety. The intense pallor of his face, his sparkling eyes and the thick smoke issuing from his mouth, gave him a truly diabolical appearance. Several minutes elapsed, and then Silvio broke the silence. "'Perhaps we shall never see each other again,' said he. "'Before we part, 
I should like to have an explanation with you. You may have observed that I care very little for the opinion of other people, but I like you, and I feel that it would be painful to me to leave you with a wrong impression upon your mind. He paused and began to knock the ashes out of his pipe. I sat gazing silently at the ground. You thought it strange, he continued, that I did not demand satisfaction from that drunken idiot R. You will admit, however, that having the choice of weapons, his life was in my hands, while my own was in no great danger. I could ascribe my forbearance to generosity alone, but I will not tell a lie. If I could have chastised R, without the least risk to my own life, I should never have pardoned him. I looked at Silvio with astonishment. Such a confession completely astounded me. Silvio continued, Exactly so. I have no right to expose myself to death. Six years ago, I received a slap in the face, and my enemy still lives. My curiosity was greatly excited. Did you not fight with him? I asked. Circumstances probably separated you. I did fight with him, replied Silvio, and here is a souvenir of our duel. Silvio rose and took from a cardboard box a red cap with a gold tassel and embroidery, what the French call a bonnet de police. He put it on. A bullet had passed through it about an inch above the forehead. You know, continued Silvio, that I served in one of the Hussar regiments. My character is well known to you. I am accustomed to taking the lead. From my youth this has been my passion. In our time dissoluteness was the fashion, and I was the most outrageous man in the army. We used to boast of our drunkenness. I beat in a drinking bout the famous Bortsov, of whom Denis Davidov has sung. Duels in our regiment were constantly taking place, and in all of them I was either second or principal. My comrades adored me, while the regimental commanders, who were constantly being changed, looked upon me as a necessary evil. I was calmly enjoying my reputation when a young man belonging to a wealthy and distinguished family, I will not mention his name, joined our regiment. Never in my life have I met with such a fortunate fellow. Imagine to yourself youth, wit, beauty, unbounded gaiety, the most reckless bravery, a famous name, untold wealth. Imagine all these and you can form some idea of the effect that he would be sure to produce among us. My supremacy was shaken. Dazzled by my reputation, he began to seek my friendship, but I received him coldly, and without the least regret he held aloof from me. I took a hatred to him. His success in the regiment and in the society of ladies brought me to the verge of despair. I began to seek a quarrel with him. To my epigrams he replied with epigrams which always seemed to me more spontaneous and more cutting than mine, and which were decidedly more amusing for he joked while I fumed. At last, at a ball given by a Polish landed proprietor, seeing him the object of the attention of all the ladies, and especially of the mistress of the house, with whom I was upon very good terms, I whispered some grossly insulting remark in his ear. He flamed up, and gave me a slap in the face. We grasped our swords, the ladies fainted, we were separated, and that same night we set out to fight. The dawn was just breaking. I was standing at the appointed place with my three seconds. With inexplicable impatience I awaited my opponent. The spring sun rose, and it was already growing hot. I saw him coming in the distance. He was walking on foot, accompanied by one second. We advanced to meet him. He approached, holding his cap filled with black cherries. The seconds measured twelve paces for us. I had to fire first, but my agitation was so great that I could not depend upon the steadiness of my hand, and in order to give myself time to become calm, I ceded to him the first shot. My adversary would not agree to this. It was decided that we should cast lots. The first number fell to him, the constant favorite of fortune. He took aim, and his bullet went through my cap. It was now my turn. His life at last was in my hands. I looked at him eagerly, 
endeavouring to detect if only the faintest shadow of uneasiness. But he stood in front of my pistol, picking out the ripest cherries from his cap and spitting out the stones, which flew almost as far as my feet. His indifference annoyed me beyond measure. What is the use, thought I, of depriving him of life when he attaches no value whatever to it? A malicious thought flashed through my mind. I lowered my pistol. "'You don't seem to be ready for death just at present,' I said to him. "'You wish to have your breakfast. I do not wish to hinder you.' "'You are not hindering me in the least,' replied he. "'Have the goodness to fire, or just as you please. The shot remains yours. I shall always be ready at your service.' I turned to the seconds, informing them that I had no intention of firing that day and with that the duel came to an end. I resigned my commission, and retired to this little place. Since then, not a day has passed that I have not thought of revenge, and now my hour has arrived. Silvio took from his pocket the letter that he had received that morning, and gave it to me to read. Someone, it seemed to be his business agent, wrote to him from Moscow, that a certain person was going to be married to a young and beautiful girl. "'You can guess,' said Silvio, "'who the certain person is. "'I am going to Moscow. "'We shall see if he will look death in the face "'with as much indifference now "'when he is on the eve of being married, "'as he did once with his cherries.' "'With these words, Silvio rose, "'threw his cap upon the floor, "'and began pacing up and down the room "'like a tiger in his cage.' I had listened to him in silence. Strange, conflicting feelings agitated me. The servant entered and announced that the horses were ready. Silvio grasped my hand lightly, and we embraced each other. He seated himself in his telega, in which lay two trunks, one containing his pistols, the other his effects. We said good-bye once more, and the horses galloped off. Chapter 2 Several years passed, and family circumstances compelled me to settle in the poor little village of M. Occupied with agricultural pursuits, I ceased not to sigh in secret for my former noisy and careless life. The most difficult thing of all was having to accustom myself to passing the spring and winter evenings in perfect solitude. Until the hour for dinner, I managed to pass away the time somehow or other, talking with the bailiff, riding about to inspect the work, or going round to look at the new buildings. But as soon as it began to get dark, I positively did not know what to do with myself. The few books that I had found in the cupboards and storerooms I already knew by heart. All the stories that my housekeeper, Kirilovna, could remember, I had heard over and over again. The songs of the peasant women made me feel depressed. I tried drinking spirits, but it made my head ache and moreover I confess I was afraid of becoming a drunkard from mere chagrin, that is to say, the saddest kind of drunkard, of which I had seen many examples in our district. I had no near neighbours, except two or three topers, whose conversation consisted for the most part of hiccups and sighs. Solitude was preferable to their society. At last I decided to go to bed as early as possible, and to dine as late as possible, in this way I shortened the evening, and lengthened out the day, and I found that the plan answered very well. Four versts from my house was a rich estate belonging to the Countess B., but nobody lived there except the steward. The Countess had only visited her estate once, in the first year of her married life, and then she had remained there no longer than a month. But in the second spring of my hermitical life, a report was circulated that the Countess, with her husband, was coming to spend the summer on her estate. The report turned out to be true, for they arrived at the beginning of June. The arrival of a rich neighbour is an important event in the lives of country people. The landed proprietors and the people of their households talk about it for two months beforehand, and for three years afterwards. As for me, I must confess that the news of the arrival of a young and beautiful neighbour affected me strongly. I burned with impatience to see her, and the first Sunday after her arrival I set out after dinner for the village of A, to pay my respects to the Countess and her husband, 
as their nearest neighbour and most humble servant. A lackey conducted me into the Count's study, and then went to announce me. The spacious apartment was furnished with every possible luxury. Around the walls were cases filled with books and surmounted by bronze busts. Over the marble mantelpiece was a large mirror. On the floor was a green cloth covered with carpets. Unaccustomed to luxury in my own poor corner, and not having seen the wealth of other people for a long time, I awaited the appearance of the Count with some little trepidation, as a suppliant from the provinces awaits the arrival of the minister. The door opened and a handsome-looking man of about thirty-two years of age entered the room. The Count approached me with a frank and friendly air. I endeavoured to be self-possessed, and began to introduce myself, but he anticipated me. We sat down. His conversation, which was easy and agreeable, soon dissipated my awkward bashfulness, and I was already beginning to recover my usual composure when the Countess suddenly entered, and I became more confused than ever. She was indeed beautiful. The Count presented me. I wished to appear at ease, but the more I tried to assume an air of unconstraint, the more awkward I felt. They, in order to give me time to recover myself, and to become accustomed to my new acquaintances, began to talk to each other, treating me as a good neighbour and without ceremony. Meanwhile I walked about the room, examining the books and pictures. I am no judge of pictures, but one of them attracted my attention. It represented some view in Switzerland, but it was not the painting that struck me, but the circumstance that the canvas was shot through by two bullets, one planted just above the other. "'A good shot, that,' said I, turning to the Count. "'Yes,' replied he, "'a very remarkable shot. "'Do you shoot well?' he continued. "'Tolerably,' replied I, rejoicing that the conversation had turned at last upon a subject that was familiar to me. At thirty paces I can manage to hit a card without fail. I mean, of course, with a pistol that I am used to. "'Really?' said the Countess, with a look of the greatest interest. "'And you, my dear, could you hit a card at thirty paces?' "'Some day,' replied the Count, "'we will try. In my time I did not shoot badly, but it is now four years since I have touched a pistol.' "'Oh,' I observed, "'in that case I don't mind laying a wager "'that your excellency will not hit a card at twenty paces. "'The pistol demands practice every day. "'I know that from experience. "'In our regiment I was reckoned one of the best shots. "'It once happened that I did not touch a pistol for a whole month, "'as I had sent mine to be mended. "'And would you believe it, your excellency, "'the first time I began to shoot again, "'I missed the bottle four times in succession at twenty paces.' Our captain, a witty and amusing fellow, happened to be standing by, and he said to me, "'It is evident, my friend, that your hand will not lift itself against the bottle.' "'No, Your Excellency, you must not neglect to practice, or your hand will soon lose its cunning. The best shot that I ever met used to practice at least three times every day before dinner. It was as much his custom to do this as it was to drink his daily glass of brandy.' The Count and Countess seemed pleased that I had begun to talk. "'And what sort of shot was he?' asked the Count. "'Well, it was this way with him, Your Excellency. If he saw a fly settle on the wall—you smile, Countess, but before heaven it is the truth—if he saw a fly he would call out, "'Kuzka, my pistol!' Kuzka would bring him a loaded pistol. Bang! And the fly would be crushed against the wall. "'Wonderful!' said the Count. "'And what was his name?' "'Silvio, Your Excellency.' "'Silvio!' exclaimed the Count, starting up. "'Did you know Silvio?' "'How could I help knowing him, Your Excellency? "'We were intimate friends. "'He was received in our regiment like a brother officer, "'but it is now five years since I had any tidings of him. "'Then Your Excellency also knew him?' "'Oh, yes, I knew him very well.' Did he ever tell you of one very strange incident in his life? Does Your Excellency refer to the slap in the face that he received from some blackguard at a ball? Did he tell you the name of this blackguard? No, Your Excellency, he never mentioned his name. Ah, Your Excellency, I continued guessing the truth. Pardon me, I did not know. 
Could it really have been you? Yes, I myself, replied the Count, with a look of extraordinary agitation, and that bullet-pierced picture is a memento of our last meeting. Ah, my dear, said the Countess, for heaven's sake do not speak about that. It would be too terrible for me to listen to. No, replied the Count, I will relate everything. He knows how I insulted his friend, and it is only right that he should know how Silvio revenged himself. The Count pushed a chair towards me, and with the liveliest interest I listened to the following story. Five years ago I got married. The first month, the honeymoon, I spent here in this village. To this house I am indebted for the happiest moments of my life, as well as for one of its most painful recollections. One evening we went out together for a ride on horseback. My wife's horse became restive. She grew frightened, gave the reins to me, and returned home on foot. I rode on before. In the courtyard I saw a travelling carriage, and I was told that in my study sat waiting for me a man who would not give his name, but who merely said that he had business with me. I entered the room, and saw in the darkness a man covered with dust and wearing a beard of several days' growth. He was standing there near the fireplace. I approached him, trying to remember his features. "'You do not recognize me, Count?' said he, in a quivering voice. Silvio, I cried, and I confess that I felt as if my hair had suddenly stood on end. Exactly, continued he. There is a shot due to me, and I have come to discharge my pistol. Are you ready? His pistol protruded from a side pocket. I measured twelve paces, and took my stand there in that corner, begging him to fire quickly before my wife arrived. He hesitated and asked for a light. Candles were brought in. I closed the doors, gave orders that nobody was to enter, and again begged him to fire. He drew out his pistol and took aim. I counted the seconds. I thought of her. A terrible minute passed. Silvio lowered his hand. I regret, said he, that the pistol is not loaded with cherry stones. The bullet is heavy. It seems to me that this is not a duel but a murder. I am not accustomed to taking aim at unarmed men. Let us begin all over again. We will cast lots as to who shall fire first. My head went round. I think I raised some objection. At last we loaded another pistol and rolled up two pieces of paper. He placed these latter in his cap, the same through which I had once sent a bullet, and again I drew the first number. You are devilish lucky, Count, said he with a smile that I shall never forget. I don't know what was the matter with me, or how it was that he managed to make me do it, but I fired and hit that picture. The Count pointed with his finger to the perforated picture. His face glowed like fire. The Countess was whiter than her own handkerchief, and I could not restrain an exclamation. I fired, continued the Count, and thank heaven missed my aim. Then Silvio, at that moment he was really terrible, Silvio raised his hand to take aim at me. Suddenly the door opens. Masha rushes into the room, and with a loud shriek throws herself upon my neck. Her presence restored to me all my courage. "'My dear,' I said to her, "'don't you see that we are joking? How frightened you are! Go and drink a glass of water, and then come back to us. I will introduce you to an old friend and comrade.' Masha still doubted. "'Tell me, is my husband speaking the truth?' said she, turning to the terrible Silvio. "'Is it true that you are only joking?' "'He is always joking, Countess,' replied Silvio. "'Once he gave me a slap in the face as a joke. On another occasion he sent a bullet through my cap in a joke. And just now, when he fired at me and missed me, it was all in joke. And now I feel inclined for a joke.' With these words, he raised his pistol to take aim at me, right before her. Masha threw herself at his feet. "'Rise, Masha! Are you not ashamed?' I cried in a rage. "'And you, sir, will you cease to make fun of a poor woman? Will you fire or not?' "'I will not,' replied Silvio. "'I am satisfied. I have seen your confusion, your alarm. 
I forced you to fire at me. That is sufficient. You will remember me. I leave you to your conscience. Then he turned to go, but pausing in the doorway and looking at the picture that my shot had passed through, he fired at it almost without taking aim, and disappeared. My wife had fainted away. The servants did not venture to stop him. The mere look of him filled them with terror. He went out upon the steps, called his coachman, and drove off before I could recover myself. The Count was silent. In this way, I learned the end of the story, whose beginning had once made such a deep impression upon me. The hero of it I never saw again. It is said that Silvio commanded a detachment of the Heterists during the revolt under Alexander Ypsilanti, and that he was killed in the Battle of Skulana. End of section 3